So when the people on the ground are really saying, we want death to all Jews, we're going to rape them, murder them, set their homes on fire and destroy Israel. In the West, it's sanitized um, into saying Palestinians just want self-determination. Palestinians just want an end of the occupation. Palestinians just want to lift the the siege on Gaza. Well, welcome back to the Next Level Sunday interview. I am here with uh, Blake Flayton, uh, who is live from Tel Aviv, and we'll get into Blake's backstory in a second. But first, brother, just uh, how are you doing? Uh, give us an update for how things are for you. How's your mother, et cetera? Uh, yeah, I think uh, if you had my mother on, I think it would be a really different interview. Uh <laughs> I'm good given the circumstances. Uh, I think we all have a, here in Tel Aviv, we all have a different definition as to what good is now. It means just not breaking down, not crying, you know, having a an okay handle on our emotions and mental health. So, you know, uh, given the circumstances, given the situation, I guess I'm as okay as I can be. The city of Tel Aviv is very quiet. Uh, most restaurants and shops and uh even just like convenience stores are closed. Uh, most services are down. Uh, and uh, most people know somebody who has uh, either been sent to the front lines or actually I'll say everyone knows someone who has sent who has been sent to the front lines. And most people know someone uh, who has been impacted, either missing, held hostage or murdered. Uh, so this is definitely a national tragedy that we're all feeling the effects of. Yeah, you wrote uh, for the Jewish Journal. Um, it's one of the reasons I reached out to you. Um, we had, uh, you know, I wanted to speak to some folks who actually were, you know, experiencing what was happening. So you, you wrote about your experience on Saturday, um, on on October seventh. Just why don't you kind of give us a a rundown of of like what that was like? And I, I mean, I assume you woke up Saturday morning, maybe I don't know, with a hangover or something, just trying to live a normal life. But get us up to speed on what your Saturday was like. For sure. Uh, So I like to describe the day before Saturday, last Friday, which feels like a lifetime ago already, as the perfect day in Tel Aviv. You know, it was a holiday weekend, so most people weren't worrying about going back to work in a couple of days. Uh, My friends and I went to go to the beach to drink and to have a good time. And we had a lovely Shabbat dinner that the night before. And so nothing was out of the ordinary. Uh, and then Saturday morning, of course, at around 730, uh, I heard this loud boom uh, explosion over my roof. Um, and my roommate ran into my room to tell me that we were under attack. And then as I wrote in the Jewish Journal, reality simply changed. We immediately went into the staircase, uh, the, the hallway where the stairs are in my apartment building. It doesn't have a... a a formal bomb shelter because it's an older building um and of course you know we saw all of the neighbors there who had also just been woken up as well um and you know everyone is staring at their phones trying to figure out what the hell is happening and over the next couple of minutes we realize the magnitude of what is happening and that this is not just a uh, a normal attack that you know an operation that we've seen in israel countless times this is a war um and there's been terrorist infiltration and massacres um, and then, you know, everything just went numb. Um, I went over to my friend's house who uh, has an actual bomb shelter in her building. And uh, we've been here ever since. So I've been staying at her place ever since. I just threw all my shit in a bag <laughs> and uh, and made a run for it. And now here we are five days later. Have you uh, like reached everybody? You, you know, you're, you don't have anybody that you haven't accounted for in your in your life? So... Thank God I have nobody in my immediate circle who I'm close to who is missing. Um, But, you know, that can't be said for a whole lot of people in this country right now. Um, I I know people who are close to my friends who have died and who are still missing. Um, Yesterday, I went to a press conference with four Israeli American families who are still missing either a child or a parent. so it's affecting everybody, and of course, many of my friends have been, you know, sent to sent to the front line in uniform. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I, I I just you know wanted to level set and check in first, but for folks who don't know Blake, um, I just I thought there'd be some value in kind of going back 
uh, a little bit in time. So you're, you're American, actually, and uh, you went to GW. Uh, we both went to GW. We're not going to do our graduation years, you know, but uh, we went to GW <laughs> in, the same, in the same epoch. And, um, you know, uh, you, GW is such a political school, right? And um, I know you kind of have the background as know, Democrat, a liberal, you know, and you go to GW, I'm sure like many people like excited to get into, you know, politics in some way or another. Uh, oh, yeah. But you kind of came into a public, the public view, you know, because of what you saw on campus um, and what a lot of us have now seen this week um, who aren't on campus, which is the anti-Semitism coming from the left in particular, obviously there's right wing anti Semitism too, but, um, and you wrote about that, you wrote about your concerns about that, you organized around it. So, so why don't you just maybe give folks a little bit of that backstory? For sure. So you really hit the nail on the head. Uh, the GW is a very political school. I went there because I was interested in politics and wanted to work in liberal left wing spaces as I had done all throughout high school growing up in the States. Um, and, so I went to GW and I like to describe it as a place where everybody wants to be president. Um, and I immediately involved or myself. Or everybody wants to be David Axelrod. Or that, exactly. Or, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we can, we can talk about that for three hours. But I involved myself in all of these different progressive organizations and progressive spaces. Um, you know, I worked on Capitol Hill for my congressman. I was at a protest every other weekend. Uh, whether it was on campus or just in DC in general. Um, and basically I started my career in commentary on Jewish issues and um, Israel related issues um, when I began writing about the blatant anti-Semitism that I experienced in these spaces. And it took a while for me to understand that what I was hearing from the people who I had called friends and the people who I assumed were, you know, comrades in the fight, um, were not criticism of Israel. They were not political. They were not even uh, out of sympathy for Palestinians. Um, it was classic anti-Semitic tropes that have followed the Jewish people for a millennia, um, repackaged and repurposed um, to fit the the current zeitgeist. And the current zeitgeist on American universities right now um, is a very uh, hyper identitarian um, hyper left wing uh, narrative of the world and lens in which to view global affairs. Um, and unfortunately, and I believe unjustly, um, Israel is not only on the wrong side of that ledger, but Israel is the epitomizing entity of which all of this politics is organized against. Um, and, you know, I kept writing about it and I have stayed very on top of um, anti-Semitism on college campuses um, since my days at university. And, you know, it, with a day like yesterday, when you see all of these Students for Justice in Palestine chapters, and not only Students for Justice in Palestine chapters, but, you know, at Harvard, you have 34 uh, student organizations signing a letter that places all of the responsibility on Israel for what happened. And you have the, you know, the president of the NYU Bar Association, you know, saying victory to Palestine. Um, and you have students at Columbia, you know, saying glory to the martyrs, example after example. It, it feels like validation. It feels like vindication. But there's from what Jewish college students have been trying to get a lot more people to realize over the past couple of years. But in, in no way feels good. It's incredibly depressing. Um, we hope people will wake up to it now that there is justification for such like abject horror. Um, we're optimistic that this could be a turning point in how Jewish college students and their stories can be received, uh, but we're not entirely sure. Yeah, I got to admit, I was um, I, I was sympathetic to your perspective. Of course, it's not as if I didn't believe that it wasn't happening on campuses, but you know the extent of it. Right. And the pervasiveness and, and maybe the threat, you know, it's it's tough, right? When you're off campus and it's been a while, you're trying to decide like, ah, is this like eight agitators, right? Is this, you know, is this people just trying to, you know, trigger their classmates? I don't, you know, I, I took some radical views in college just for shits. Uh, you know what I mean? To like piss off yeah. people in class, right? And so uh, like trying to that? balance that. 
Yeah, well, what, was that a rocket? That was a big boom over over us. That Jeez. was a big boom. Um, you know, and then you see yesterday and this week. I mean, one thing that that struck me when you're talking about your weekend, you know, you're talking about going to the beach in the literally in the GW students for for justice in Palestine, our alma mater, in that in their statement, they said that any any Israeli or traveler who is quote lounging on our occupied beaches is an aggressor quote you know unquote and and you know the the really not really subtext the text there is that their murder their slaughter is you know part of some you know resistance fight that is that is worthy i mean that is that is sick shit and that is alarming and i i just i wonder a like what your response was or what your thought was when you're seeing this i guess it was not the surprise that my thought was and and just talk about like the pervasiveness you know like is this a small cohort you know is this the median student so i think that the uh I think in order to answer that question, we have to take a look actually off the campus and to the Palestinian cause itself, um, which, as we have been proven over the last couple of days, is ideologically, of course, there are different details such as Islamism rather than race science in its you know European essence. But in its essence, this ideology is Nazism. And it is the most barbaric and inhuman form of anti-Semitism that the world has ever known. Um, and it just so happens that that doesn't resonate very well with Western respectable liberal ears. Um, and the Palestinians know this. Um, certainly Palestinian partisans internationally know this. The Iranian regime knows this. Um, and uh you know, very far left wing thinkers and academics and intellectuals across the world know this as well. And so over the last uh, couple of decades, really, ever since the 70s, we have seen the masking of the true intentions of the Palestinian liberation apparatus, if you will, varying you know organizations. Um, we have seen them disguise their true intentions uh, with the language of social justice and the language of human rights and also West's plane, which is, you know, a play on the word mansplain. Um, sure. That is, yeah, that is coined by uh, Dr. Anat Wilfs, former member of Knesset. Um, West's explaining away what the people on the ground are really saying. So when the people on the ground are really saying, we want death to all Jews, we're going to rape them, murder them, set their homes on fire and destroy Israel. In the West, it's sanitized, um, into saying Palestinians just want self-determination, Palestinians just want an end of the occupation, Palestinians just want to lift the siege, the siege on Gaza or the blockade of Gaza. And so to millions of progressives in Western countries, this all sounds like a uh, very digestible rhetoric. Um, and very reasonable proposals and demands, um, especially when you uh, impose uh, racial relations that we have in the United States or in Europe onto Israel and construct Isra you know, the Jews in Israel as the white people, the oppressors and the Palestinians as the people of color, the oppressed. Um, that whips up a lot of anger and a lot of um, resentment against Israel and Jews in your midst. Um, and it's well-funded. Um, it is broad. It, it affects so many different universities and college, big and small, public and private. Um, and this ideology, the people who are pushing it know that these people are not going to get rid of these beliefs and grow out of them once they graduate school. They are going to enter all of our institutions, politics, media, um, 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 culture, law, I mean, you name it, and uh, bring this, this sanitized Nazi ideology into these respectable places. We've already seen it happen, which is the backing, of course, behind these statements. Yeah. I think it's important to, I want to get kind of get back to the U.S. response, but I, I want to level set a little bit because I, I, this is really, you know, kind of an intra-left and even intra-liberal, and I'm even using liberal as a small L, kind of including my people that, you know, never Trumpers, right? Like an intra-liberal, like dispute and like fissure, right? Because some people I think could listen to that answer and say, 
oh man, like this sounds like a, you know, what a, like a right wing, what a, you know, Zionist, whatever, you know, trying to, you know, impugn, you know, folks that are fighting for, for justice, but like, that's not really quite right. Right. I and mean, I think that there are a lot of people, uh, like, I think that an interesting thing about you and, and many, many others in Israel and here, American Jews, like there are a lot of liberal folks who really are unhappy with BB, really unhappy with the government. And, and, uh, yet at the same time, like recognize this threat. So, you know, kind of talk about how that is, is manifesting in this moment. And I know you were doing activism in Israel before this all happened about, you know, the quote unquote reforms that BB was putting forth. So just kind of talk about that, that fissure and, and what your view and, you know, where you kind of fit in that world. Of course. I mean, one of the reasons why Saturday was so dramatic is it was a complete 180 or 360 shift in what you know the discourse was about in Israel. I moved to Israel last year, almost exactly last September, and more or less since last September, every day here has been consumed with anti-government activism. Um, as I'm sure most listeners know, there have been major protests almost every week. In fact, every week, multiple times a week in Israel um, since the election of of this current coalition in our parliament. Um, There has been mass civil unrest. There has been, uh, you know, reservists not showing up to duty. There has been strikes from high tech workers and nurses and other army sectors of the army. Um, it's just been it's just been madness here. The the conflict between the right and the left, between the religious and the secular, um, uh, between uh, different factions in Israeli society, and that's what we thought we all had to worry about at this moment was the judicial overhaul and the potential you know dismantling of Israeli democracy, and we were really focused on the radicals in the government who are hold the most detestable far right racist views that I think a Jew or Israeli can have. It's it's disgraceful. Um, and then Saturday, the entire country came together in a minute, in a split second, and realized that we have one objective right now, and that's to uh, win first and foremost, to defeat Hamas, um, to respond with strength to what happened in the South, um, and to make sure that we are under no threat from future attacks. However, um, all of that energy that has been building up for the last year, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Israelis, um, you know, taking to the streets to make their voices heard against the government, that's not going to go away. Um, And when the dust settles from all of this, and and I really hope it will be soon, I'm not sure if that's, you know, too optimistic, um, there will be the most, uh, I'd say, vicious (laughs) and... uh, necessary inquiry against the decisions of this government that led to the disaster that we have now. Um, You know, in 1973, uh, 50 years ago this week was the Yom Kippur War, when Israel lost, you know, thousands of soldiers, combatants um, in a surprise attack that wasn't really quite a surprise attack. There was sort of deliberation in the army and the fallout from those lack of decision making, from uh, that lack of decision making, you know, shifted the political trajectory of Israel forever. You know, the 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 Labor Party that was in power in Israel since the founding of the state lost an election in 1977 to the first time Menachem Begin's Likud Party, which then began to dominate Israel off and on for the next several decades up until this moment. Um, so we can only imagine the political shift that's going to occur now. Um, and this will be Benjamin Netanyahu's legacy. During the protest movement, um, we were all convinced that his legacy was going to be the failed judicial overhaul, the dividing of Israeli society, um, and you know the corruption and the fanaticism at the very tops of our society. But now we realize it's going to be even worse, and that his egotism and narcissism and it's 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 going to be remembered for this 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 horrible day. Yeah, it's an interesting answer because right, you said that everybody comes together in a second, and and that. <laughs> 
you know, I, I can't say this from New Orleans, right? But that seems true, right? But this is different than that, right? There's the 9-11 parallels. Like we're, uh, you know, nar- e- we're speaking of nar- egocentrism where, you know, <laughs> Americans can be America, have America centrism. So everything's about us. But, uh, you know, there are these parallels to 9-11, right? This is Israel's 9-11, even though like on, there are more deaths on a per capita basis and, uh, you know, hostages. Obviously, there are a lot of differences. But but just in, in the surprise nature of it and the wake up call nature of it. But. You know, eventually there ends up being, you know, criticisms of Bush and, and, you know, uh, commissions that look into all this and et cetera, but for not for a while. And I already, you already see in the Israel newspapers and the Israel commentary at like, while the people are coming together, there is palpable frustration with, with Netanyahu's government, not just because of the, you know, uh, judicial, uh, nonsense that you guys have been protesting about, but, but because of just the lack of preparation, I, I mean, this feels like it should have been BB's, like this is BB's whole brand, right? Like yeah. Mr. Security, strength, preparedness for something like this to be caught so off guard. There's some reports that there are warning, there were warnings, you know, I, 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 it feels like very quickly there is going to be, you know, much recrimination on that point. There is absolutely going to be. And again, the two things are actually mutually exclusive. Right now, the Israeli people are coming together in a way that just reveals the absolute best of our society and our civilization as you know the world's only Jewish state and what that really means. There's donation drives and volunteer service all over Tel Aviv and all across the country. 300,000 people have been mobilized. People are caring for each other and you know raising millions of dollars from here and abroad. It's just incredible. Um, that is separate from this government. And by the way, as we're doing this interview now, um, there is news that uh, Benny Gantz, who leads one of the major opposition parties, um, and Netanyahu have uh, have accepted terms to an agreement um, that would form a emergency wartime unity government that is said to be sworn in tonight. Um, and so the ball is already rolling. The ball is already moving. People know that this is going to get intense blowback from a unified public because this war, unlike, you know, news of the judicial overhaul, if you can even compare the two, has yeah. impacted everyone with the same outrage and the same um, brokenheartedness that we didn't even know was possible a couple months ago. Um, and so there will be. And uh, it, there's going to be very interesting commentary when, when the time comes for a proper inquiry. I mean, obviously, you know, there's still hostages, blood is still being shed, right? So it's like, it's impossible to do this kind of now. But like, I mean, is there any sense there for like how this could have been just how, you know, they could have just been so blindsided by this? I mean, it just feels like unimaginable that something at this scale would have just been absolutely missed. So the, the truth is to answer that question is we simply do not know. Yeah. Uh, we have we have yet to have a, you know, compelling rock hard story that kind of lays out what exactly went wrong, how exactly all of this was missed. Because remember, this wasn't just, you know, one unit that wasn't called to duty one morning. I mean, we have supposedly a smart fence, an unbreakable barrier in between the sovereign state of Israel and Gaza. And on top of that, we have watchtowers and drones and 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 security cameras and soldiers and then we're supposed to have the police and then we're supposed to have a front line near the gaza border all the time and so this was and then and then of course first responders didn't show up to the kibbutzim that were under direct attack from terrorists for hours hours on saturday morning hours civilians had to defend themselves and their families with no weapons I mean, these are kibbutzim near the Gaza border. They're the most peace loving. I keep seeing that word. So, as a Gentile from America, I, I don't, I don't really know what a kibbutz. Is. Like, yeah. I, I was familiar with that word, like as, as a, as a gathering where people, people chat. But it, it seems yes. like it has a different, a different word than a uh, different meaning than I, than I. Of realized. course. So uh, a kibbutz is a. Uh, so <laughs> there's like the historical nerdy characterization and then there's like the current characterization. Yeah. Kibbutzim are um, small Israeli communities um, that have been a staple of the Zionist vision since long before the state of Israel was established. They are kind of the 
um, the product of socialist Zionism because they were started as completely socialist um, agricultural communities where you know everyone shares the resources, everyone shares the wealth, um, and the community provides for the community's defense. Um, a lot of kibbutzim are still very much based on the socialist model. Um, they're very predicated on um, oneness with nature, um, especially in the desert where these attacks happen. You know, oneness with uh, the Negev, which is a very sacred place in the Israeli imagination, um, and we treasure them because they're sort of this this prime example of the goodness of Israeli society. You know, kibbutzim are yeah. the heart and soul of the country, I believe, in a lot of ways. Our best and brightest come from kibbutzim. Um, and they're filled with people, you know, traditionally very left-wing, peace-loving um, um, people who, you know, provide this wonderful atmosphere for children and this wonderful atmosphere for innovation and 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 service to Israel. And, you know, we, we heard... Uh, a couple of days ago that one of the women who is suspected to have been brought into Gaza, you know, did work to provide medical care to Palestinians living in Gaza during wartime. That's your image of what a typical kibbutznik in Israel is. Yeah. Um, and she has been taken hostage. So these people had to defend themselves with nothing. And there was just mass slaughter and the security forces didn't show up for hours. And so this was a, this was a, a domino effect of complete failure and complete incompetency. And um, it's, it's just horrific. <laughs> Was there anything else to say? Huh. I, don't, I don't know if this will lead to a, any reflection on the right of the wall efficacy. But um, anyway, that's for another time. On, Amer on American stuff, uh, so B Joe Biden, um, you know, I, I think that uh, certainly there has been, you know, kind of a, a, some shocking... Uh, false equivalencies of both sides and whatever you want to say from from some corners uh to leave and and even like ed markey but but biden has remarks yesterday were astounding in my opinion maybe the best th uh speech that he's given since since his presidency uh, what is the view from israel um on you know the american response and and biden and and what's your what's your take on on you know how we've responded here so I actually was watching this speech last night with a room full of Israelis um, on the couch. Um, uh, and, you know, they were mesmerized by his speech, uh, to put it lightly. They were they were very uh, supportive of the president's words. And there was a general feeling not only in my own, you know, in my own home when we were watching this, but uh, across across the Israeli world that this was a brilliant and much needed and reassuring um, statement of support. Um, I would call it, yes, one of the best speeches of his presidency, and I would call it unprecedented in the heartfelt, you know, Zionism and and belief in the importance of Israel that came across. Um, and I think overall, uh, you know, of course, there's going to be, you know, people in Israel who, uh, you know, prefer the, the, the previous administration more, sure. but even even they, I think, can't deny that this is an important moment for us. Not a lot of sense there that uh, Joe Biden is responsible for this attack, uh, like like Senator Tim Scott said, that he's got blood on his hands. <laughs> I don't think any Israeli right now is blaming Joe Biden, of all people, for blood um, being spilled in our streets. Um, listen, I think that we ought to have an important and crucial conversation about Iran and sure. about democratic policy toward Iran, because there's no question that Iran is behind these attacks. Iran is orchestrating the motives of both Hezbollah and Hamas. Um, and there is no question that perhaps we need a, a re-examining of priorities in the Middle East. Yeah. Um, but, I, but again, I think most of that agitation has come from American right-wingers um, right. who are trying to use this moment to score a point rather than sympathize with people on the ground. Yeah. I, I think, poli sure. I and mean, there are plenty of policy reflections. I, I you know, I mean, even I, I think, uh, you know, the last the Trump administration at times like eased up on on Iranian sanctions, and and I, you know, I think there are arguments for that. And uh, but I, to me, I think the most, uh, if if you are to criticize the Biden administration, a, a more apt criticism maybe than than the six billion is, I. I it, it seems as if I think everybody was hoping that if they just stopped paying attention to the Israel, to the Palestine-Israel dispute, that maybe it was just going to get quiet and go away. 
You know, right. I mean, I, I, there are recent like Sullivan, uh, you know, recent speeches from people in the Biden administration about the Mideast policy. And I, like this conflict isn't even brought up. Right. Uh, you know, right. there's this focus on the Saudi deals, uh, and the Abraham Accords and all these other areas. And I think that the fact that we had had a not even uh, protracted, maybe it's overstated, but like a brief period of qu- relative quiet, you know, in the conflict, I, I think I did think li- led to some naivete and kind of a lack of focus on on trying to reach some sort of solution. For sure. I mean, and there is political context to that as well. Um, what the Trump administration did that even I have to say, American liberals, especially Israeli liberals, but even American liberals began to understand was that and and this is, you know, Netanyahu's platform. This is his this is his whole uh, concept of, of organizing the world and organizing the conflict. Um, he he thinks and the Abraham Accords were a sort of vindication of this idea that if you make peace with the larger Arab world against the axis of Iran, then the Palestinians will have no choice but to accept self-determination um, within the parameters that Israel and the international community allows it. Um, yeah. And again, after we saw Israel sign peace accords or normalization accords um, with the UAE and Bahrain and later in Sudan and later in Morocco, this seemed to be the the way forward this seemed to be the logical thinking that this was the way to go we will isolate the palestinians because the palestinians have only been able to sustain their war against israel and these constant terror attacks because they have had support from the outside arab and then certainly islamic world and so we thought that if we cut off that support and we cut off that assurance that you know, bigger and larger powers are going to have your back all the time then they're going to not going to have a choice but to come to the table. That right. was the shift um, that the Abraham Accords brought about. And in fact, uh, these events that have happened in Israel over the last couple of days, I will say strongly suspicious that they come as a reaction to the news that Israel and Saudi are on their way to normalizations because this is in some ways the Palestinians saying uh, not, no, you will, no that this yeah. they know that this will be the end of their struggle because this is this will be if Israel and Saudi make peace effectively the end of the Arab Israeli conflict that has been going on since 1948 and they know that their support system besides Iran will be completely cut off um and uh they don't want this to happen and they want the Saudis to stop it and that's why they did this um so you can say in respect to the Biden administration the Biden administration accepted this new conventional wisdom, yeah, like a lot yeah. of Israelis and liberals around the world did, Israeli liberals and liberals around the world. Um, I don't think you can blame them, but I think after today's event, we realize that, you know, this is going to be actually more complicated than we thought. It's not the first option of the like Clinton Obama years of make peace with the Palestinians and then peace with the Arab world will come after. And it's not the Trump doctrine and the Netanyahu doctrine of make peace with the Arab world and then peace with the Palestinians will come. It's not black and white. There's going to be a lot more complications in both directions. Yeah. Uh, so I, I hadn't, uh, to be honest, I chose my, uh, my naivete about the region. I had a lot of complaints about the Saudi Biden normalization deal they were working on, but it had like the response from Gaza, from Palestine, from Hamas, like was, uh, you know, that unintended consequence was something that I hadn't even thought about. And, and several folks, um, like you have heard make compelling case on that, on that point over the past few days. Um, I want to, we could do a whole podcast on Zionism and, you know, two state solution and all that. So I, I don't want to, you know, go totally down that rabbit hole, but I, you know, I do think that there are going to be some listeners of this podcast or on, you know, some people that discover it that are, that are also of the left that, are compelled by the view that, you know, maybe not the GW students for Palestine view that anybody sitting on a beach um, in Israel, you know, should, should, you know, should be murdered because they're a colonizer or whatever, but, but might be sympathetic to the view that, that the Israeli state is engaging in an apartheid, that they are colonizers, that they, you know, that there is, you know, something fundamentally wrong with with the with their their existence and this whole mo- this whole model. 
I, I just at the top level wonder, you know, what your pushback would be or, or what message you'd have to those folks as, you know, they have intra, you know, conversations within liberal spaces, within progressive spaces where, you know, you've been having these discussions since since you were in college. Right. Um, you know, every time a conflict breaks out, I think about the people who are going to be reading and listening to things about this conflict for the first time. And, you know, right. it's always like a oy va voy moment because what information are they going to see first that's going to probably dictate what lens they view the conflict through through the next uh, couple of years? Um, look, this is a very simple question. This is a crucial question. You have to ask yourself and you have to ask the people around you in liberal spaces is do the Jews have the right to their own country with their own army in part, not all, but in at least some of their ancestral homeland where they trace their national and religious identity back to? That is the crucial question. If your answer to that is yes, because it is yes for most all people in the world because most of our planet is divided into nation states where groups you know control their own destiny um if your answer is yes then you're a zionist and you support the state of israel um and its protection that does not mean at all as we have seen from the last year of israeli protests against the government which made the israeli flag and you know national symbols like the Declaration of Independence and the IDF uniform, the symbol, the emblem of our protest against the far right, you know, insurgents in Israel. Um, that does not mean you agree with all Israeli policy, of course, but it does mean that you're does mean that you're a Zionist. If you say no to those parameters of the Jews having self-determination in their ancestral homeland, then you are an anti-Zionist. And I want to stress very clear, there is no such thing as a nonviolent, non-anti-Semitic anti-Zionism in the region of Israel-Palestine and the wider Middle East. The only time that anti-Zionism can carry an air of respectability and intellectual honesty, because it often you know, invokes dreams of a binational utopia where Israelis and Palestinians have equal rights and you know, we live together in a sort of John Lennon imagined universe. That only exists in Western academia and on the iPhones of college students. And it, this disconnect, I hope, from this latest conflict is being bridged here. That if you refuse to support the Jewish state, their right to a state, without, with all the politics away from it, their right to a state, then you are de facto sending your support to these people instead, because these are the people who are actually on the ground pushing for your worldview. You know, it's not Judith Butler firing rockets into Tel Aviv from Gaza right now. It's a Hamas terrorist who wouldn't think twice about killing you and your entire family. That is the difference that we are up against. That is the, the, the discrepancy that we're up against right now. And then, so then, okay, but what do you say to somebody that says, oh, well, I guess then using those definitions, I'm a Zionist, but I am deeply angry by how the Israeli government has acted out the Zionism and treatment of Palestinians. Not everybody that lives in Palestine is OK with the actions of Hamas. Um, and, you know, though we need to, you know, have it view this. There has to be a way to view treatment of Palestinians through a social justice lens. Like, what's your response to that? My response to that is bring me one. Bring me one Palestinian from the West Bank and or Gaza who, before we get into a debate about Israel and Palestine and who has the right over which land and what things went on in history that dictates you know where we are today, I want to have a conversation with a Palestinian who says to me within the first two minutes of the conversation, the Jewish people have a historic and ancestral right to part of this land and they have a right to national self-determination and national self-defense defense on this land. And all we, the Palestinians, want is a independent state of our own in the West Bank and Gaza. But the problem is, is there has yet to be one. I mean, you're looking at 
the social media and commentary from the last couple of days and all of the people who are saying this isn't what Palestinian resistance look like. Um, you know, we need an end to the occupation. This is about settlements. This is about the blockade. This is about the open air prisons. They're not Palestinian because the Palestinians have made very clear multiple times over the past several decades that the only thing that they desire is dead Jews and the eradication of a Jewish state. Period. There has yet to be a movement in Palestinian civil society to reject this. Every single time that the Israeli government has tried to make peace, has tried to establish uh, independent everything for Palestinians, it has been rejected and it has been met with violence and war. And look, I'm a peacenik. I'm an Israeli of the left. I believe wholeheartedly in the end of the settlement project and the establishment of the two-state solution. But hopefully more people around the world will see now how even the farthest left Israeli has a breaking point where you cannot negotiate people who are not even operating in the same universe as you. You're willing to give, they're only willing to take. Um, I, your passion here is so obvious. I, I just, I do wonder, I meant to ask this at the top, like, what was the draw to you, this, like, the ancestral homeland, you know, idea? Talk, talk about that and, like, what, what, you know, brought you to where you are right now? Well, so, um, <laughs> I am not a very religious person at all. Um, and Zionism, the concept of Zionism was first thought of and then enacted and then defended by predominantly secular Jews. Um, Zionism came out of the tradition of the European Enlightenment um, that stopped placing so much emphasis on uh, religion and faith and kind of clergy doctrine. And that's how it started in the Jewish community. The Jewish community in the 1800s and the 1900s started looking at all of the anti-Semitism around them and started asking themselves, what are our rabbis doing for us? For 2,000 years, we have prayed and prayed to be restored to the homeland, to be restored to the place where we were kicked out 2,000 years ago. And yet we have not been able to make it happen. And we've only been met with violence along the way, year after year. We need a complete revolution, a rebellion in Jewish affairs and that's where Jewish nationalism, Zionism springs up as a rebellion against the strict Jewish theology that mandated, you know, the following of, of, of commandments, the following of Torah as the primary way to be a Jew. Now, in our 21st century, I feel increasingly or I felt increasingly before I made Aliyah that the only way to express my Jewish identity was through religion was through closeness to a faith, um, to God. And I just can't feel close to a God of which I do not believe. And therefore, Zionism serves as a sort of third way, quote unquote, for Jews to feel Jewish, for them to feel Jewish in the national sense, in the sense of belonging to a peoplehood, of a culture, of a history, and all of the things that go along with it, language, customs, piece of land, without uh, going to synagogue and without, you know, following the commandments of, of our God in the, in the Old Testament, sure. right? And that's what Israel offers to millions of Jews, both in Israel and around the world. Around the world, Jews connect to feeling Jewish by their Zionism, by the, you know, the Israeli flag and the feelings of pride that they have in Israel. And that's ultimately why I decided to make Aliyah, because um, it offers, you know, the secular option, I like to call it. Are you, are you planning on staying? Have you thought about all that in light of this? Yes, I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm planning on staying for the for forever. Um, I think this these recent events have only strengthened that resolve. Um, you know, I was supposed to go to New York this week uh, for a uh, for a big family event. My whole family was flying out there, and I don't get to see them that often. But you know, I canceled those plans yesterday because I just have to be here. Like, I can't leave this community behind. It's it's in times like these, it's more crucial than ever to like you know. The, all the Israeliness. <laughs> if uh, if your mother was on this podcast, what would her answer to that question? <laughs> question be? <laughs> oh, I don't even want to talk about my mother right now. My mother has been. Um, listen, my mother is going to be fine. It's, but I, the the real question is, how are the mothers of this country going to be? You know, even in the next 
you know, two weeks, two months, two years, is th- there's going to be millions of parents and children who have post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is 20 times worse than 9-11 if you consider the scale um, yeah. based on the population of America and the population of Israel. And it's all just a short drive from us. You know, it's like if there was a 9-11 and all of the country was situated in the tri-state area. Right. Um, okay, I want to let you go, but I, I do I do have to ask what's next. I mean, you have to just, uh, you know, I, I'm not asking you to pull out a crystal ball, but there's to be a fear for where we go in the next week and, and a fear for the young people of Gaza, uh, you know, the kids, uh, you know, that, that are there, the hostages that are there, the families. Like, what is the sense right now for, like, not not what is next as in 2025 but what's next like this next week what is coming um so i think it's pretty certain at this point that israel is going to um launch a ground invasion into gaza which is completely unprecedented um it promises to you know bring untold amount of casualties um an untold amount of destruction and that's just localized to Gaza. You know, there's hundreds of thousands of, of uh, reservists who are stationed up north um, should the event that Hezbollah get involved in this conflict, even more than they have. There's already been a reports right. of shooting across the Lebanese border. So I think we're in for a extraordinarily difficult um, couple of days and couple of weeks. Um, look, there needs to be a humanitarian, first and foremost, there needs to be a humanitarian uh, corridor opened in conjunction with Egypt and the United States. I feel very strongly about this because I feel, and I can predict, I'm not a military strategist, but this is just common knowledge at this point that what is going to happen in Gaza is going, th- what, this is what our defense minister recently said, what was will no longer be. Um, this is going to be a, a event of, enormous proportions um and if we can save as many civilians and human life innocent human lives as possible then the united states and egypt need to be on top of that very soon um civilians from southern lebanon have already begun uh, evacuating from their homes and moving further into the country that is completely necessary because um the idf basically has a mandate right now to carry out justice um, on the people responsible for this in any way they want. And especially from the speech last night with Biden, uh, we have we have assurance going in. Um, can, yeah. Can Gaza even, like, how does Gaza even continue to exist after this? Uh, it's just very Look, it's hard to imagine. I don't think it is going to, at least in the way that it did before this event and i don't say that with any you know anything but sadness and fear over what that means for the region yeah. um in the future how can uh people help uh do you have i know that you're involved in groups there are there groups they can support or donate to or what what would you recommend yeah there's a bunch of groups that you can donate to um the friends of the idf um is a big one um, there's also um, uh, this program called Adopt a Safta um, that brings food to uh, elderly people who are isolated in Israel. Um, and I'm sure uh, I'm sure you can uh, find on social media. There's there's so many organizations and donation drives that it's at this point a little bit overwhelming. Um, but also just you know taking um, a stand with Israel or you know. A stand against terrorism, at least, and the killing of innocents online, making your voice heard, you know, sharing the message with your friends. That that is that does a ton of good as well. Thank you, Blake. Hang in there. We're sending you our love. Appreciate you taking the time, man. Thank you so much. Peace.